Hello everybody, welcome to episode 195 of the Intercooler podcast with me, Dan Prosser, Andrew Frankel, my co-host, sitting opposite me yeah. in a studio. A studio, I'm not used to this. This is the first time strange. First time we've done this. Yeah. We are, we're trying out a new professional podcast studio. Um, we It means we can sit in front of each other and actually be in the same room and have a, a proper conversation. They're better conversations that way, I think, when you're in the same room. Yeah. Um, we've got professional really good quality recording equipment we've got cameras so those of you yeah, i'm not sure they're an advantage <laughs> <laughs> so those of you watching on youtube um hopefully this is a bit better than the two of us peering into the little webcams built into our laptops um we can also get guests in and uh we can put them up on the big screen um so doing it this way hopefully elevates the whole podcast hopefully makes it a much better listening and watching experience is this not now technically a vodcast I think it probably is. Wow. Let's not use that word, though. No, it's terrible. Okay. Um, so, well, we're, we're talking about the German Autobahn this week, but yeah. <clears throat> we did weird engine configurations yes. last week, and I think you've got a couple more that have sprung to mind. Well, yes. Um, it was amazing. The amount of people who got in touch with me and said, that yes. was really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because um, yes, I, I thought it was just a very strange one to do. But anyway, it seems to have resonated. So... Um, Yes, two more. Um, and I, 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 neither of these ever went into a car, so far as I'm aware. So, so, so I will be brief, but they are so utterly bonkers. So one of them is called a Napier Deltic. Go on. Okay. Now, Napier Deltic was an 18-cylinder, two-stroke supercharged diesel. And if that sounds nuts, it's nothing compared to... It's a triangular engine. <laughs> okay. It's a triangular. If you look at it, um, what you will see is, and it's also got an opposing piston. So we talked about this bit in the last one, yeah. where the pistons form the combustion chamber. Mm. So if you think of a triangle, each leg of the triangle has two pistons hurtling towards each other, and when they meet, they go bang and prism back. Okay, and you've got that new three legs. Okay, and at each corner of the triangle, you have a crankshaft. So you've got three crankshafts, <clears throat> um, six pistons, three cylinders. And then you multiply it up until you've got 18 cylinders. And these were used in motor torpedo boats. They were used in locomotives. They were actually really pretty successful. Um, you could get about 2,500 horsepower out of them. And yeah, I, I just thought I'd mention it because it's just, it's probably to look at. Go and look up a Napier Deltic. Um, there's actually um, quite a nuts. good um, demonstration on Wikipedia of how it operates. And it looks completely nuts. But anyway, uh, the other one um, was a Rolls-Royce engine mm -hmm. called the Vulture. Good name. Good name. Okay. <laughs> the Vulture was, would you believe it? And this was, this, was an air, this was an engine which was made. It was used. I'll tell you about the aircraft it went into in a minute. Um, it was an absolutely serious. It was an X-24. Okay. Right. Okay. Which actually is actually, unlike the Napier Delta, is incredibly easy um, to explain. Think of a V12 and another V12 underneath it. Oh, okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So you have basically have two V12s. One of them's upside down. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all mounted onto a common crank. So you wow. have four banks of six cylinders Oof. to make 24 cylinders. Um, how they managed to get, you know, the oil system working, getting all the oils out the heads that were upside down. How, I don't know how that, well, in fact, it, it clearly didn't work. It mm. went into a thing called the Avro Manchester. And the Avro Manchester, if you go and look at an Avro Manchester, you'll think that looks familiar. Because when that failed, it was a two-engined heavy bomber. They thought, hmm, the Vulture's not worked. What we'd better do is give it four smaller engines. And they called the result of that the Lancaster. Ah, okay. There you go. So the Manchester was the two-engine version of the Lancaster, which came first, and these vultures—they were so unreliable. Um, they just used to go pop all the time, and they caused the well. They, they were a very substantial contributor factor to the failure of that aircraft, and a very substantial. It, you know, but for the vulture, who knows whether the Merlin, the V12, mm. would ever have found its way into the Lancaster? Who knows whether the Lancaster would even have been created? So at least we have that to thank it for. And there, I should promise you, I shall close the subject of weird configurations, at least until I can think of another one. Yeah, or someone gets in touch, as many of you have done. Yes, and so what about the yes. such and such? Yeah, well, yeah, thank you for everyone who did do exactly that. It was 
it was a good fun one that episode hopefully well i learned a lot um maybe one of one or two of you did as well um but let's move on to this week's topic yeah the german autobahn so yes. germany's motorway network yes um and as we know you can drive as fast as you like on the autobahn yeah right in theory yeah. <laughs> in theory yeah i mean we want to we want to talk about it because it's to maybe it's, it must just be totally normal to a, a typical german driver but to us it's still a bit exciting when you get onto the autobahn and you see that de restricted sign yeah and it's a funny thing because you know that there isn't a speed limit there technically yeah when you go into a, a, a de-restricted zone but it still feels like you're being quite naughty going above 80 above 100 in, you know into the the really quite fast yeah um 100, 150 plus it yeah. feels like you're being extremely naughty well it it, it is extreme well i mean it, it depends it's just like all these things isn't it it just depends yeah what's there and around you at the time mm. there are times when you know, I've cruised down German autobahns at 150 miles an hour, a speed which would bang you up in any British prison for quite a long period of time. Um, and I would defy anyone to say that what I was doing was dangerous because there was yeah. nothing on it. The conditions were perfect and I was in a, you know, a very, very well-engineered modern car. There are other times when you're doing like 110 and you're thinking, this is properly sketchy. Um so yeah, I mean, it's you, you can't just say you know they're safe or they're unsafe or they're right or they're wrong, um, but yeah, a, as you say, a lot of the time when you are doing it, you are sort of thinking, I can't quite believe I'm allowed to do this. Yeah, yeah, it is amazing. Yeah. Um. So we'll we'll come to some of our own stories about driving on the on the autobahn and perhaps the reality of driving on the autobahn as well. Yeah. Um. But let's do a little bit of background. the The autobahn network has a total length of just over eight thousand miles. Wow. Almost 8,200 miles in 2021, um, which seems like a lot, actually, I have to say. Um, there, in de-restricted zones, there is an advisory 130 kilometer per hour or 81 mile per hour yeah. limit. It's yeah. advisory. So it's mean, not... So meaningless. Well, it, sort of. It's not illegal to drive faster than that. But if you have a collision going more than 81 miles per hour, there can be increased liability. Mm. You can be, mm. um, well, you can be, the law The law can come at you harder if you were and driving I, And I think I'm right in saying that even if, <clears throat> excuse me, even if there isn't a collision, um, but there's a, I don't know, there's a policeman on the side of the road or whatever, and they see you weaving through the traffic at 170 miles an hour, yeah. you can still be done for dangerous driving. Yeah, yeah. which is fair enough, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. It's not just speed that's the, that's the issue here. No. Um, in 2017, um, there was a, r a report that revealed that 70% of the autobahn network only had the advisory limit, so essentially no limit. Um, there was a small percentage with temporary speed limits due to weather or traffic, and 23% had a permanent speed limit. Um, so actually, it is... That really surprises me, yeah. because I when I'm, when I'm on autobahns, I, I seem to be always in the bit where there's a permanent speed limit. Mm. And then you get these little stretches where it's on your woo, mm. <clears throat> and then you know five miles later you're back into the. I must be driving in the wrong bit of Germany. <laughs> I know, but it's seven, yeah seventy percent. I um, find that hard to believe. Well, yeah. So, but this is a bit interesting. On a a six lane section of autobahn, so three lanes either side, yeah. either, either direction. Um, average speeds in free flowing conditions, so decent weather, not too busy, eighty eight miles per hour for cars. That's actually quite fast, isn't it's it? It's clipping along that, isn't yeah. it? Average. 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 Because there will always be, you know, people doing 60, won't there? Which means mm. for every one of those, there's somebody else doing three figures. Mm. Yeah. But I, I, but actually, that's not that's not so surprising because some people on the autobahn, and you and I will have both come across them, for them, the correct speed is as fast as they can make their car go. Mm. And they sit there, don't they, in the in the outside lane with an indicator on mm. permanently mm. Um, and you can see them coming up behind you and if you can't get out of the way or I don't know choose not to it is stunning how fast they come up on you and how close to you they are prepared to get before they just land on the anchors because they just presume there's this automatic presumption that you're going to leap out of the way yeah yeah um yeah, and I, f I find that genuine. I find it intimidating, and I find it scary, and I, and, and, and I, I, yeah, I really am not a fan of that kind of driving at all. When was the M1 first put down? Seventies or sixties? Was it seventies? Nineteen sixties. So the the German autobahn network is much older. Um, there yeah. was 
a section. I, mean, I'll, I think our first bit of motorway was, I think it was the Preston Bypass, it was, oh, that's which true. is actually now part of the M6. Yes, that's uh, true. And that was in the 1960s. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so there, there was a section from Frankfurt to Darmstadt opened in 1935. Yeah. Um, very straight section. Yes. And of course, no limit then still, or even back then. Um, and the Grand Prix teams would use it. Mercedes-Benz, also well, they, Union. They, they did a speed record test there. Yeah. They built special cars. Mm. Incredible, beautiful aerodynamic machines to see. And all they would do is go down that stretch of road from Frankfurt to Darmstadt, mm. um, which you can still do. And see how fast they can go, and yeah. they went unbelievably fast. So Rudolf Gracciola, I think his his record is set, and the record is at two hundred and sixty eight miles per hour. Yeah, but then back then, yeah, but Bert Rosemeyer, yeah, in 1938, um, he went out. I think it's a two way average, isn't it? Because I think he'd gone faster than Caracciola. Had he? Um, but there was a crosswind, and they said to him, "You don't want to go back." Really bad idea. I mean, that is oh. properly sketchy. Yeah. Um, and he go, he won't go back. And he did. Yeah. And that was it. Big crash. Terrible. <clears throat> Got, I mean, everybody thinks it was literally um, a crosswind that caught the car. These, I mean, these bullets, these cars, which are all about just pure aerodynamic efficiency, nothing mm. to do with downforce, nothing to do with trying just to streamline, aren't they? Just pure streamliners. Yeah. Um, and not even Rosemar, who was widely and quite rightly regarded as certainly in Germany and probably in the world with the possible only other exception of, of Nuvolari as the most talented driver of his day not even he could catch it um, mm. and the car sailed off into the woods and uh, very sadly that was that for, for Burton Rogemeyer oh, gosh um, <clears throat> so we all see those emergency telephones on Britain's motorway network um, <clears throat> but they have them in Germany as well 17,000 of them gosh uh, and even today, when we all have mobile phones in our pockets, connected to the car probably, there are 150 calls made each day using those phones. And they automatically alert the operator to to where the caller is. Yeah. Um, which I thought was quite clever. Now, one of the, the, the interesting things about the, <clears throat> the Autobahn network is that the German car makers, most of them, signed up to the gentleman's agreement, didn't they? 155 miles per hour. And even now you still see that quoted as the top speed for a lot of cars. But I think the likes of BMW, Mercedes, Audi, they've, particularly with their ultra high performance cars, they've let that gentleman's agreements, agreement slip, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, it's become a marketing opportunity because, you know, well, a sales opportunity because yeah. they will now sell you an upgrade pack. Yeah, they will. Um, which will allow it to do, you know, your car to do 186 miles an hour, 300 kilometers per hour. Um, but they charge mm. money for that, even though it's it, it's clearly all you have to do is remove a line of software. Yeah. Um, it's also um, another reason that they weren't too sad about it was um, you've got to engineer if a car, you know. Let's take a big seven series BMW or a big S class Mercedes, mm. which because it's so aerodynamic and really quite powerful, could probably do the thick end of 200 miles an hour. Well, you've got to engineer a car to a completely different standard if it's going to do 200. You've got to engineer the brakes, the suspension, the tyres. You end up with a much more expensive car, um, probably with a far worse ride. I mean, this is something yeah. that Bentley, who never restricted the top speed of their cars, have always. Um, you know, found very difficult was, you know, because they engineer their cars to be safe and, you know, to do what they do at, you know, over 200 miles an hour. Mm. 155, completely different kettle of fish, mm. completely different. So you get a much cheaper, easier car, which for almost all people, almost all the time, will be better um, because it'll cost less, less to buy um, and it'll be more comfortable because it'll ride better because it doesn't have to have, you know, stiffer suspension, firmer, thicker tyre sidewalls and so on. But the the fact that you can drive <clears throat> very quickly on the on the autobahns mm. that must have influenced the design and engineering of German cars profoundly yeah. over the years. And not just how they are designed and built, but the types of car that they design and build um, in Germany. Uh, you can compare them to French cars. Mm. You you can spot them a mile off. You could you could look at the silhouette of a French car and a German car and know which is which probably. Mm. Um, so having that autobahn network probably means that the German manufacturers and German buyers have favoured saloons, often bigger ones, often powerful ones, yeah. often quite sporting ones. So it's that one law that there is no 
restriction on speed on parts of the German autobahn has massively influenced that whole industry. Yeah, and it's not just the design, it's also the engineering of it. I mean, it's less so now, but there was a time when Audis were engineered to have this massive dead patch in their steering just off centre. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, you know, I think they used to call it the sneeze factor. Mm. And, and it was there so that if for any reason, you know, I don't know, a child reached over or you were distracted or you sneezed or whatever, and you're doing 150 miles an hour mm. down, down your autobahn, and there was an unintended input into the steering, the car wouldn't fly off the road. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> Which, you know, in that particular, very specific, That's a frankly, thing. pretty rare set of circumstances, is a great thing. Yeah. The whole of the rest of the time, yeah, it's, not it's a want. total pain. It's not what you want. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that is interesting. Um so, that, yeah, this 155 mile an hour gentleman's agreement, um, they sort of play a little bit fast and loose with it now. Um, but as you say, in, in many ways, it's a sensible idea because you do actually compromise a car when you make it capable of far higher top speeds. And the other thing is, 155 miles an hour, I mean, you've done it, I've done it, plenty of people listening to this yeah. have done it. I don't think many people who wanged into their 155 mile an hour speed limit on their cars were sat there thinking oh this is a bit dull i want to go faster mm. i want I, I, you know, I want to you know it's in a public arena where mm. there are other people and trucks and you know you always have to assume that no one has seen you nobody knows you're there because you don't know that they have um 155 miles an hour is i mean is plenty, and I guess we're going to get on to the sort of the ethical rights and wrongs yeah. of speed limits. Yeah. Um, and I'm sort of slightly in two minds about it, but you know, I, I, what I wouldn't say is that oh, you know, 155 is terribly restrictive because it's just, it just spoils your fun so much. Mm. It's cobblers. 155 mm. is plenty. Mm. That is enough. Yeah, <clears throat> on that, a public road, that really is. Um, yes. So this is a huge debate in germany it's actually an extremely contentious topic Very. the de-restriction of the autobahns yeah it's a massive thing mm. um and every election season it comes around um it's a proper political lightning rod isn't it mm. um i don't i don't think it's going to be sensible for us to weigh in and tell all the you know the german people what it is they should be doing but we can we can discuss the sides of the argument can't we um we need to we need to talk about safety. Yeah. Um, there's I've dug up some interesting stuff on this. Now clearly, we all know that you can make statistics argue whatever case you want to argue for. You can't you? You can you can cook the books any way you like. Yeah. Um, so let me just share two different statistics that perhaps represent both sides of the argument. Um, <clears throat> in 2014, autobahns carried 31% of motorized traffic while accounting for just 11% of traffic deaths. Yeah. So that's an autobahn fatality rate of 1.6 deaths per billion kilometers traveled compared to 4.6 on urban streets and 6.5 on rural roads. So far and away, the safest roads in Germany are autobahns, even without a speed limit. Measured that way. Measured that way. Yeah. However, as uh, many people have pointed out, you don't have traffic coming towards you. No. You don't have pedestrians. You don't have cyclists. Yeah. Um, so it's perhaps not a fair comparison. Um, but the, the difference, 1.6 deaths per million kilometres compared to 4.6 on urban streets, 6.5 on rural roads, it does perhaps suggest that there are more pressing issues than the de-restriction of the autobahn. If you want to reduce the number of deaths on the road, maybe you look elsewhere, don't you? Well, I think I think that is a very good point, and I think clearly there's an awful lot of work um, going on in those areas. Mm. Um, but it would be interesting. I don't know if you have this to see the per kilometer death rate on a de-restricted piece of autobahn compared to a restricted piece of autobahn. Yes, have you got that? Um, it, well, it's it's presented in a slightly different way. So. <clears throat> 26% fewer people died on autobahns with a speed limit per kilometre. So like for like, 26% fewer. So yes, more people do die on de-restricted than on restricted stretches of autobahn. Okay, that interests me because I thought I thought the number would be higher than that. Mm. I thought it would be like 
you know, you're twice as likely to die mm. on a de-restricted as on a restricted bill, four times as likely. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but that clearly is not the case. No, no, and and that is like for like per kilometer. So it's yeah. it's 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 not a night and day difference, is it really? No, no. Which I find it very interesting indeed. Um, now, perhaps the other. Um, stat that we can discuss is how Germany's motorway network compares to others in Europe. Um, the safest in terms of deaths per per billion kilometers traveled, Denmark's 0.72. Then it's us, the United Kingdom, 1.16. Yeah, but that's only because our roads are so congested you can't go fast enough to kill yourself. <laughs> Possibly. No, I think I think, I think it's a real true. factor. I think it's a real factor. Yeah. Yeah, then, I, would, I wouldn't say that we have for any reason. I can't think of any other reason why. I mean, it sure as hell ain't smart motorways, is it? No, it's, no. Um, you know, there's no other reason why our figures should be, you know, better than anyone other than Denmark's. So after Denmark and the UK, you've got France, Austria, and then Germany. So Germany um, is it's not top of the table, but it's it's not at the bottom by any means. And actually, it's ahead of Finland, Belgium, the Czech Republic, Switzerland. Yeah. And even Slovenia. France, you know, France has 140, um, so 130 kilometer speed limit. Lots of other countries, 120. Mm. Um, and yet France is, you know, but again, I, I don't know. It's, 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 it's strange. I'm not sure that, I think you can go reading all sorts of things into it. I think, as you said, you're absolutely right. You can, you can turn these statistics, yeah. you can sort of bend and meld them any way you like to prove whatever argument is you're trying to put mm. forward. You can. Yeah. Um, just as an aside, let me give you another stat, which is eye-opening, actually. Germany, 1.74 deaths per billion kilometres travelled. Yeah. 1.74. The United States, what speed limit do they have? Well, it's it all varies, over the place, doesn't it? It, it varies. It, every, and then 55 to 85. Uh, yeah, okay. 3.38 Double. Yeah. Yeah. Double. That's okay. Extraordinary. Because in, Aust in America, not, well, I don't know. So this is, me, this is me leaping wildly to conclusions. But there is no lane discipline in America. Undertaking yeah. is not only done, it's entirely legal. Yeah, it's not even, there's no requisite for, no, um, absolutely not. no requirement for lane discipline, no, is there? Absolutely. Yeah. No, none whatever. Mm. Um, so also, you have massive rigs in America, don't you? Mm hmm. Um, if one of those, I don't know, has a puncture or the driver falls asleep or whatever, that's a problem. It's just going to take out more cars than you know than anything smaller that you get in yeah. in Europe. So this whole debate <clears throat> about whether uh, a blanket speed limit needs to be introduced on the autobahn is a huge topic in yeah. Germany. There's also presumably there's an environmental debate around it too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no question about it. Yeah, the faster you go, the more energy you consume. Yeah, exactly. And the, the more you spew out the back, you yeah, know, that's just a um, fact. And you know, you and I both know because we both live reasonably near it. You know, the uh, if you go if you're on the M4 in South Wales around Newport, there's a 50 mile an hour speed limit yeah. on it, and it's literally there. Um, or the Welsh government says it's literally there because of air quality levels. Mm. That's what it's there for. Mm. It's there to reduce emissions. Mm. Um, I, I would imagine in Germany there aren't that many cars going that fast to make a massive difference, but maybe there is. But I mean, but but clearly the environmental argument is one that's only going to get stronger. Mm. Yeah. So there's the German Auto Club, which is uh, one of the the groups that campaigns for things to be left the way they are. Mm. They like the de-restricted autobahn, um, and the slogan that they've been using since the 1970s is "free driving for free citizens." Um, and even in that slogan, you you can tell how this topic becomes polarizing, divisive. It becomes a left-right issue. Um, it's as with so much political discourse, there's very little nuance, and whichever side of the argument you're on, you make it bigger than it is. So it, it comes down to freedom. Yeah. Like a, a citizen's freedom. Yeah, but also, you know, but then the other side would say, yes, but it is m my right as a free citizen not to be killed by some yeah. twat doing 170 miles an hour. And it's hard to argue with that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's a really, really difficult issue. I have, uh, I think on this podcast, certainly in print over the times, I, I have railed against this idea that speed kills, mm. okay? Um, and that's always, it, you see it on the signs, you know, the road safety lobby always says speed kills. Speed never killed anybody, only it's inappropriate use. Yeah. 
Yeah, there are times, as I have said, when you can be doing a three-figure speed on a deserted autobahn in a modern car on a sunny day, and that is safe. There are times when you can be doing 40 miles an hour outside of school at chucking out time mm. when that is utterly lethal. Mm. Without context, the speed is a meaningless measure. Um, and you know, I am someone who, who would restrict people's right to live their lives the way they want to um, at gunpoint. I think that generally speaking, if in doubt, you should be allowed to do it as long as it doesn't interfere with anybody else. And that is the problem, is that it does interfere with other people. You know, completely innocent um, yeah. outsiders who are entirely law, but do get caught up. And I don't, I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, anybody's expecting you and I to sit here and, and go, well, the answer is clearly this. This is what you need. So I don't have an answer. No. I don't, I mean, I don't like the idea of anyone saying, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. But at the same time, I think you have to recognise um, that these things have impacts beyond beyond the individual who is doing it. And is that fair? Is that right? Is that a fair price? Is that a sensible price to pay um, to protect what people regard to as their civil liberties? It's a, it's an impossible. It's clearly it's an impossible issue because it's been rattling on for as long as it has. But it, it is interesting that almost. Every other country in the world, apart from the Isle of Man, mm. and there will be one, maybe one or two other places I, I don't know about, have taken the decision that actually, for the greater good, um, we do need to limit. And then, then, then you get in the argument as well: what should that limit be? Yeah, yeah. And you know, our limit of seventy miles an hour was set um, back in the nineteen sixties when. You know, 70 miles an hour was a proper speed for a car to be going. You know, there'd be lots of cars there which would barely do 70 mm. miles an hour. Um, they had terrible tyres. They had terrible brakes. Um, they folded up like, you know, crisp packets if they ever hit anything. And yet here we are in 2024. Um, and, you know, cars are massively fast, massively safe, stop brilliant. They do all these things fantastically well. Um, and yet we are subjected to the same restrictions. And people will say they'll prove what if you do 80 miles an hour, you'll kill this many people and you do 70 miles. And it's like it's like the sort of the Welsh speed limit in that's just come in um, in towns and villages across, across Wales of, of 20 miles an hour blanket. Um, and uh, without even getting into all the laws of uh, unintended consequences about pe how people behave and how frustrated they get and the dangers that they create of doing 20 miles an hour. The argument for that is, is that you'll kill fewer people at 20 miles an hour than you will at 30. But you'll you'll kill even fewer people at ten, mm. or if you just don't get in your car. Mm. So where do you draw the line? Mm. I don't have an answer mm. for that. But it's you know it's a debate that goes on and on and on. Um, I mean, for myself, I quite like the idea that there is still somewhere, and this is just me talking very personally, that you can go and let a car really yeah. go. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but I would only ever do it as someone who's been doing this for a while um, and understands a bit about cars and driving fast in an environment which i thought was completely safe mm. um and i know exactly how far into the distance you need to be looking um how clear the road has to be and so on and so forth and actually the truth is, is that there aren't very even on the unrestricted things and this is something which we'll probably get onto. you can be on an unrestricted autobahn that doesn't mean you're going to be going, you're going to be able to go flat out because you know autobahns are busy yeah yeah they are <clears throat> i mean we'll come on to the reality of driving on these yeah. roads in a moment but the, the, it, as I've said, it's such a massive topic in Germany, and actually, it goes right to the heart of the German identity of German culture, um, because this is very interesting. It, it was in December 1952 that all speed limits on all roads were abolished, Gosh, because Germans voted against them because they seemed like Nazi relics, uh, and this was about Germany throwing off the shackles. And emerging but they into didn't new... dig up the autobahns, which are also Nazi relics. Well, that's true. That's true. Um, and then slowly, at state level, speed limits were introduced in town on rural roads, um, but not on the autobahn. Um, and so, when people start, when people talk about putting a speed limit on the autobahn, others get so irate, so worked up about it because um, it's such an emotionally charged topic reaching all the way back to the end of the nazi um regime it's it's but a, it's a that, powerful but, but, potent but, thing but it was almost a lifetime ago yeah wasn't it um well that's right and uh, there is 
the head of the Green Party in, I think it's Hess, uh, Tarek Al-Wazir. Um, he's really campaigning for speed limits. Um, and he says, the speed limit in Germany has a similar status as the right to bear arms in the American debate. At some point, a speed limit will become reality here, and soon we will not be able, be able to remember the time before. It's like the smoking ban in restaurants. I think that's a difficult one, isn't it? Because... God, we could get ourselves into so much trouble here. <laughs> um, but the right to bear arms in the States, you know, look at you, you, you were wheeling out statistics earlier, and, and, and we concluded that we were surprised by, okay, more people tend to die on unrestricted, but it's not massively, wildly more. No. Look at gun crime in the US mm. um, and how the right to bear arms has created a situation which is unique in the world in terms of the number of people who die as a result of that right. Um, you know, so you're not really comparing like with like. It's it's not all. a comparison you should make lightly. No, not you, at all. You sh you really need to think about how you back that up before you say that, don't yeah. you? That's a, it's a bold thing to say. Mm. Um, so it's a huge debate in in Germany, and we're not going to solve it now, nor are we going to try. But we can talk about what it's like to drive on an autobahn. Yeah, because I I feel the same as you. I mean, I've I've done it plenty of times. I've been reasonably quick. I think one seventy something plus yep. maybe 175 yeah quick enough but every time i've done it you're doing those speeds for short bursts mm. you're looking miles down the road because the roads are busy and it's just a matter of time before someone pulls out in front of you and you you have to back right off again i think it is the automotive equivalent of going to a mcdonald's mm. it is a it's an instant sort of sugar hit high whatever that ultimately leaves you feeling completely empty yeah mm. i think it is one of the most overrated automotive pastimes you can indulge in um as you say the first thing that happens is you know the first time i can remember this so clearly um i was on my way to my first ever um job at the nurburgring um and i was in a porsche 968 club sport and um, I can remember getting onto my first ever stretch of unrestricted autobahn and just thinking, well, hey, let's we go. go. But I couldn't because mm. there was just too much traffic around. Mm. And then, you know, you'll come over Browber Hill and you'll think, oh, it's a bit clearer now. And so you'll go and then something will pull out in front of you and you're on the brakes. And, you know, unless you're going to go and do something specific, like go to what you, what you know is a very quiet stretch and you've gone there for that reason and then get up at four o'clock in the morning. And then, you know, getting your car. And there are lots of car journalists. I mean, I can remember that um, back in my autocar days, um, a motoring journalist who many listening to this will have heard of, David Vivian, and a chap called John Lyon, who started the High Performance Club, went to Germany to do 200 miles an hour on a public road in a Lamborghini Diablo. Uh, and the opening picture of this story was a sort of very, very sort of fuzzy in-car shot uh, in which you could just about see the speedometer pointing at 200 miles an hour. And you know, the efforts they went to, even then, when the roads were a hell of a lot quieter than they are now, to find somewhere where you could... And the whole point was, can you safely do 200 miles an hour on a public road? Their conclusion, not mine, theirs at the time, was that they could. But you had to have basically the fastest car in the world. Mm. You had to have two professional drivers. You had to get up at half past three in the morning and you had to be you know, on the quieter stretch of unrestricted autobahn in Germany. Now that's an awful lot of you know, dots to join yes. up, isn't it? Yeah, before yeah. you can actually mm. say you can go and do that. And for the most part, it is just sort of you know, a quick squirt here and there. You know, what you're not going to do on an unrestricted autobahn in Germany in any normal set of circumstances, is just sort of, you know, put 150 miles into an hour. No. It's just not going to happen. No. You're not going to get there much quicker. Um, you know, I think that point to point, I think that, that you would be faster in France obeying the speed limit than you would be in Germany because you have to pay to go on the auto roads and, and the country itself is much less populous and therefore the roads are that much quieter. So you can, in France, you know, put your cruiser on 140 k's um, and just go. Mm. Um, you can't do that on the autobahns. I think, because you know, we know, don't we, that people do go to Germany because there is this promise of being able to go really well. And apart from anything else, 
Go on, okay, okay, I'm going to go off on one in a minute. Um, <laughs> apart from anything else, even if they were completely empty, you know, driving in a straight line just isn't an awful lot of fun. That's mm. not what we love cars for. You know, if you think of the cars we love best, none of them are because they'll do 200 miles an hour. It's because they feel right, they handle beautifully. You know, you feel, they feel alive, you feel alive as a result. Um, it's not because they've got huge amounts of power and are very good at going in a straight line because there's no skill in that. And ultimately, you're just sitting there in your chair with your air conditioning on waiting for a number to come up on a dial while mm. taking probably quite a big risk. Mm. I just I just wouldn't bother. Or do it once yeah. and think, well, okay, I've ticked that box and then you never have to do it again. Mm. The other thing is, if, if you've got a top speed 150 odd, Okay, I'm not talking a, de- a restricted speed with a car that might otherwise do 180 or whatever. Yeah. If you're clipping along at 150, close to the car's maximum speed, yeah. you're burning a hell of a lot of fuel at mm. that point, aren't you? Yeah. So you're not going to be able to sit there doing 200 miles because no. you'll be pulling over to fill the bloody tank. Yeah. And also, you know, if your car's top speed is 150 miles an hour, you won't believe how long it'll actually take to get there. Yeah. You know, you'll be sitting there at 130, you'll be thinking... Well, this isn't accelerating very fast, and you'll be getting 131, 132, and it gets slower and slower and slower. Uh, and we know this from back in the days when we used to spend our lives as you know as full-time road testers, maxing cars on the Millbrook Bowl and places like that. Um, it takes miles mm. before you'll get to your car's top speed. So anybody who thinks, oh, you know, I'm going to go and max the old girl, you almost certainly won't because mm. you'll need so much space. So that's a, you know, that's a red herring as well. Mm. Yeah. You're, you're right about France, though. I've, often when you do a, a trip to through Europe, and I found myself on German autobahns, they are busy. busy. There's a lot of tra- yeah. traffic, a lot of haulage on them. Mm. Um, <clears throat> lots of roadworks as well. Very, very narrow road, roadworks, in my experience. And so they can be quite stressful. They can be hard work. And then you go across the border into France, and often they're so lovely and clear. Mm. There's no one around. Yeah. You can't... You can't go absolutely flat out, but as you say, no. you're probably covering ground just as quickly. Last if, last if summer, quickly. I was in Croatia, and I had to do a one-day hit from the bottom to the top of the country. Um, and their motorway network is appears to have been built last week. Mm. Um, the limits are 130 k's, and there's nobody on it. Mm. And the, and you can really, really cover the ground in the way there's no way you would be able to do in Germany. And the other thing is in Germany, and you know you will have had this too is that when you do have an accident there, or when you have, but when there is an accident there, it tends not to be a small one. Mm. Um, And the amount of times in the, whatever it is, 35 years I've been doing this job, I found myself just sat on an autobahn or actually stood outside the car because the whole thing's been shut because somebody has binned it in a fairly catastrophic way. Um, And there's nothing quite like slowing you down for, you know, having to spend three hours stood at the side of a motorway waiting for, you know, the wrecking crew to come and clear Mm. it up. Mm. Quite... So this this sort of idea, it's almost a fantasy of sitting at 150 mile an hour plus in your big German saloon car, covering ground at a, at a hell of a lick. It's not really, maybe some it, people it, do it, I don't know. but It, it, it is a fantasy. Yeah. It, it, I mean, some people, I mean, there was, there's a German banker um, who has or had, probably still does have, a McLaren F1. Um, and I can remember seeing that car back at Woking where it was being serviced and they would interrogated it and they discovered it had done 200 miles an hour every day because that was this bloke's commute to work in his F1 and he would just mm. go down the autobahn at 200 miles an hour. I presume he went to work very early when there was nothing on the autobahn. Um, so, yeah, I'm not saying that it is simply impossible to do it, but for the vast majority of people in the vast majority of circumstances for the vast majority of time, it's one of the most overrated pastimes that there is. Mm. That, okay, so what, yeah, that's right. What I was going to say, the thing that appeals to me about the autobahn, and it would be, I think it would be a pity if this was lost. It's going back to one, one of the stats I, I offered earlier. The average speed, average, on a six-lane clear um, motorway in good conditions is 88 miles an hour. Yeah. So you couldn't, you can sit at 90, maybe 100 quite comfortably yeah. and really cover ground yeah, at that speed. Yeah, but but that's in good conditions when there's not yeah. much traffic and and those conditions are rare in Germany. Mm. Um, you often get bad weather there. You always have heavy traffic. Um, you know, I'm sure that is right in ideal conditions, but you know, that's that that, that that isn't the real world. 
So I'm sounding like I've got a complete downer on these um, unrestricted. I don't. Um, and for myself, you know, put a gun to my head, I wouldn't vote in favour of having those re- those restrictions lifted. No. All I'm saying is that for anybody listening to this who hasn't gone and done it... Who, yeah, who thinks it's a driving mecca and you're going to have yeah, the time of your life. Just, just go and do a, you know, go and do a, an auto test in an MX-5 in a car park. You'll just have so much more fun. Yeah, it's true, actually. It's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, you will. Um, yeah, so I, I think I agree with you. I'm, I'm not in favour of um, ever more legislation ever more restrictions um but clearly if you're going to permit people to travel extremely quickly amongst other people other traffic those people have to really think about what they're doing and we haven't even discussed maintaining your car properly and your tires for those speeds there there are so many things you have to think about and for you know you you can put up all the advisories you like and do everything but you know idiots exist yeah yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, it's not a bar to owning a fast car to be an idiot. No, no. Um, you know, you can still do it. And, I mean, there is there is this argument. You, you don't really hear it anymore, I guess, because of the rise of track days and that sort of thing. But people will say, oh, yeah, the moment they put um, a, I don't know, an 80-mile-an-hour speed limit on the autobahn, what possible reason is there for a car manufacturer to build the car that does more than 80 miles an hour? Mm. Because that would be them inciting their owners to break the law mm. because they can do speeds that can... They, they can get capable of speeds which are legal nowhere in the world so then all cars have a blanket top speed you get to 80 miles an hour and just stop <laughs> I don't want that to happen <laughs> <laughs> it's funny isn't it it is we it don't is want funny. that to happen no, no. no. I, I, I'm not sure I can satisfactorily but, but the moment why, but yeah. you, but, I mean, you understand the, the at least the theory behind it but the moment it is illegal anywhere in the world to do more than 80 yeah. miles an hour yeah. What's what the point? possible justification is there for creating a car mm. that mm. does do more than 80 miles an hour mm. and the answer to that is of course there are always racetracks thank goodness yes. yeah. as long as we've got those Yeah. Um, there we go then German autobahns now I know that lots of you are going to get in touch with your, your own experiences and perhaps you feel particularly strongly one way or the other um, on the debate that rages on around the autobahn and I, I'll be very interested to to read your messages so so please do get in touch um we are running out of time so we need to wrap this one up we have yeah. got a listener question coming up in a moment so you're going to think it was written by dan p from just outside bristol it wasn't I'll, well specifically try and trip me up no 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 okay. no um but before i read it out to you i really do not know what these reader questions are every yeah, i think people think that sort of Dan tells me what they're going to be a week. I literally have no idea no, what's coming up. No, you don't know this one. No. Um, I'm not that good an actor. So before we do the listener question, I'm just going to remind you all to rate and review the podcast. That really helps. But also while you're doing that, just hit the little follow button or the subscribe button. If you're watching on YouTube, um, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. We do much more than just these videos on our YouTube channel. So hit the subscribe button and check out what we do on YouTube. Um, this one, as I said, it doesn't come from Dan P just outside Bristol. It comes from Sulev, um, who thank you, Sulev. Yes, who well, wants? I'm not sure that yet. Go it's, on. it's about the Alpine A110. Oh goodness! <laughs> but he he wants to know what the differences are between the models because there is now the A110R. Yes. Best part of a hundred grand. Yes. I've not actually driven one. Twice the car. No half. No. Twice the money, half, <laughs> half the car. car. There you go. Well, there you, that might answer the question. But can we just briefly explain what the difference is between an A110, oh, can you do it, A110S and an A110R? Um, I can do the A110 and the A110S. So okay. The, well, okay. So an, A, well, an A110 is what we call a standard car, yeah. i.e., aka the best car. Yeah. Uh, it's the cheapest. It has, well, fill me in when I get it wrong. It's got like a 246 horsepower engine. Yeah, 48, yeah. Yeah, 248 horsepower engine. And um, it's absolutely lovely. Yeah. So the S is, it's got more power, 296 horsepower? Yes, I think so. 90, but it's got, 92 maybe. Yeah. yeah, but it's got no more torque because mm. the gearbox is limited. So you only actually feel the extra oomph up the top end. Yeah. Um, put your foot down at 3,000 revs, the same thing happens in both cars. Uh, it's got stiffer suspension, it's not as good a car yeah. because you lose that suppleness, you lose the subtlety, you, you lose some of the balance. It's, you know, the, the magic that made us persuaded us to give it the only 10 star rating we've ever given any car mm. um has gone from that the a110r which, the, the only one i haven't driven okay so the, the problem with it is it i think it's ninety six thousand pounds yeah <laughs> it's so expensive and it's got it's a bit lighter i think it is 
in its sort of lightest form it is under 1100 kilos mm. it's got some aero on it it's got stiffer suspension it's got michelin cup two tires so what they're trying to do is make a fast one and in the lap time it is fast but to drive on the public road again um it's just not as nice and it's it's the difference between fast and fun isn't it and we've, mm. we, and we've been down yeah. this road many many times before and unless you've done it it's very hard to convey just that sense of inherent rightness that you get in a standard boggo base a 110 on a nice road the car is so supple it breathes with the road um and you just think this is a car that has been set up with me as a driver on the road in mind and the other cars are sort of they're variants of that. They're deviations from that. And they, they may go quick around a track, but I don't care about that. Mm. They're just not as good. Is the R unbearable on the road? Or is no, it not it's not unbearable stuff? at all. It's just not yeah. as good. No, it's not unbearable at all. I mean, the R is, if there'd never been anything else, mm. and they just produce this and go, what do you think of this, guys? We go, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. It's fantastic. Mm. Um, but the money is crazy. Mm. Um, and although it is much, much faster... And it, you know, it still handles incredibly well and everything else. It's just it's just not a car that I warm to anything like as much as, mm. the, as the original and the standard car. Mm. There you go, Sulo. Thank you for your question. Um, we'll leave it there. Now, next week, we have a guest, a returning guest, Richard Bremner. Um, we're going to talk lots more nonsense about BL, British Leyland, and yes. Rovers, and all sorts. Uh, uh, and also the ones that he owned and has and still owns. Yeah, because it's Of quite... which there are an unfathomable <laughs> number. <laughs> it's quite a few. Yeah. Um, so we're, listen we're looking forward to that one. Thank you ever so much for listening. Tune back in next week when we've got Richard Bremner back. See you then.